Well, it's a great privilege for me to be here with you today and sharing my thoughts on the issue of India's grain policy and the world. Uh, at a personal level, I must apologize that I couldn't be with you physically, but my heart and my soul is very much with you uh, right now. On the topic, uh, let me start by saying what the state of play is on Indian agriculture scene and especially on the grain policy front. Uh, feeding 1.2 billion people today, five years back, sitting in India, we could never imagine. And most of the policy makers were totally uh, unaware of the fact that India could be exporting 22 million tons of cereals in 2012-13 and about 18 to 20 million tons in 13-14. So in two years, 12, 13, and 13, 14, the financial years of India, India would be exporting about 40 million tons of cereals, which it has never done in the last 3,000 years of its written history. And India has also emerged as the largest exporter of rice in the world in 12, 13, and 13, 14 again. Now, if we look at the diagram, what we can see is that there is a dramatic change from 10, 11 onwards. And this is the period, if we look at between 7 and 11, India had an export ban on ex wheat and common rice. And that's why the exports were subdued only of basmati and a new phenomenon, maize, corn exports started coming in, but uh, wheat was totally banned. Uh, the reason for that was that in 2006 7, uh, India had imported uh, almost 6 million tons of wheat. And in 2007 8, when the global prices erupted, India put a ban on exports of wheat and rice. But by 2011, in September, when the policy making in India changed and it opened up exports of wheat and rice, you can see a dramatic change uh, what happened. And uh, this year we are going to be exporting roughly 20 million tons of uh, cereals, wheat, rice, and corn together. Uh, valuing at about uh, 10 billion dollars. And this is not only a story of uh, whether we call it a success or not, a big story in terms of uh, exports of cereals, but also the stocks at home, uh, both wheat and rice stocks uh, are almost at record levels. Uh, as on July 1st, 2012, it had crossed 80 million tons. It has marginally come down uh, to about 73 million tons in 2013 and likely to stay between 70 to 80 million tons even uh, this year. And this is against the buffer stock norms, which are roughly 31.9 million tons, 32 million tons, you can say. So it's uh, almost 100 percent, more than 100 percent higher than the buffer stock norms. Of course, the buffer stock norms need to be revisited in the light of uh, Food Security Act that India has launched, to which I'll come later. So how did this happen? You know, uh, the big story is not what is happening, but uh, how did it happen? That's where we need to see how many millions of lives and uh, income of the farmers has been improved. And as I said earlier, India imported 6 million tons of uh, wheat in 2006. We imposed bans on exports. And uh, the real story lies in this uh, dramatic turnaround uh, from a panic and deficit of grain to surplus stocks and massive exports that took place just within a period of five years. Uh, the answer to the best of our analysis shows that there are two major factors behind this. One was the national food security mission that India launched in 2007. Uh, the objective of that mission was to raise the food grain production by 20 million tons in the next five years. 
the target was 10 million tons of rice, 8 million tons of wheat and another 2 million tons of pulses in 5 years. And the focus, uh, the central pivot of that strategy was a delivery of better seeds in those areas where there was a lot of uh, untapped potential, uh, farm practices had to be improved and uh, some other technologies especially uh, irrigation or even uh, machinery, farm machinery uh, was promoted in those areas of central India, eastern India and southern India. The net result was very, very unexpected. Instead of 20 million tons of target, India achieved 42 million tons of additional food grain production in 2011-12 over 2006-7 level. Now, the big question is, is it only the role of technology, the miracle seeds, uh, these were not new seeds, these were all high yielding variety seeds uh, which had been uh, there uh, on the shelf for a long time. So, what was it that triggered this sort of a second green revolution uh, in the untapped areas of uh, India? And I feel that the trigger of this came from uh, a very good incentive policy which was uh, embodied in minimum support prices, but which actually followed what was happening at the global level after the eruption of uh, food prices in 2007-8. The minimum support prices of wheat were raised by about 33 percent and of paddy by about 31 percent in 2008-9 over 2007-8. And this led to a major change in the incentive structure for wheat and rice and which gave very robust results. If you look at the graph, you can see continuously these uh, MSPs have been rising in nominal terms and we will see in dollar terms where they stand vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Uh, but the fact is that uh, the period after 2007-8 turned out to be very different as the price vector in India started adjusting to the global price vector. And this is a fascinating graph which shows that despite export bans that India put on wheat and rice in 2007, the domestic prices uh, which we can measure through wholesale price index of food and the global uh, food price vector measured through FAO's uh, food price index 2002-4 is equal to 100. By 2013, uh, we find that the global food price index was at 210 and exactly the same story was repeated for India. If the Indian price you see, you can see that India avoided the spikes in global prices, but there was a convergence by 2013 Indian food price index was exactly at the same level at which the global price index was. And this is what I would call the globalization of Indian agriculture and that had its own uh, benefits and the pros and cons uh, that India had to uh, take into stride. Now, when Indian prices were being raised, does that mean that India went overboard and there is a debate within India whether MSP price increases were much more than what was uh, required or needed because uh, did it contribute to domestic food inflation in the country. And if you look at the uh, wheat MSP in India uh, currently hovers around 224 dollars a ton and compared to uh, selected countries in the region, Pakistan's uh, is about 285 dollars a ton. In China, it is about 390 dollars a ton. And if you look at the FOB prices during the last one year or so, you find that the FOB prices for wheat have hovered between 275 to about 310 dollars a ton. So, looking at the wheat MSP in India, we are still somewhat at a lower level and there is scope to go up further depending upon what is uh, happening to domestic uh, food price inflation. A similar story is there for rice, I do not have the time to go into the details, but we are still very much nearer to the Vietnami prices rather than the Chinese prices which are much higher uh, or the Indonesian or Philippines or even Thailand prices. 
So overall story is that aligning somewhat the domestic prices to global prices changed the incentive structure and that triggered a major change in the production and procurement processes and exports. What lessons we can draw from this entire thing? I think the key lesson is that price policy does play a critical role and farmers can respond to price signals adopting better technology, seeds and farming practices which raise the overall production and productivity in the system. And this is, uh, if you recall, uh, it's the same strategy which was adopted uh, during the late 60s when the miracle seeds from uh, Mexico came to India and at that time the prices commission was established in India agriculture prices commission along with food corporation of India to make a positive price policy environment so that the technologies can get an enabling environment where they can thrive and uh, spread very fast. Uh, what another thing that we need to note is that this is the new areas uh, earlier it was the Punjab region in India which led the green revolution but now uh, the wheat particularly is coming up in newer areas like uh, Madhya Pradesh and one can see in this graph how the production uh, in Madhya Pradesh is catching up to the production levels in Punjab and these are the areas where prosperity is coming and the second green revolution as at least in wheat is coming. Where is the Indian grain policy headed now and what we like to put today that after having achieved good production base, India is shifting its focus from production to distribution because there is still massive poverty in India and malnutrition in India. The approach adopted is entitlement approach under the life cycle and the National Food Security Act has been passed in September 2013. Now what this act envisages is distribution of about 61.2 million tons of cereals at highly subsidized price. It is roughly at one tenth the economic cost. Uh, rice will be sold at rupees 3 a kg, wheat at 2 rupees a kg and core cereals at 1 rupee a kg and uh, there will be about 5 kilograms given to per person per month to priority households and about 35 kilograms per household under there is another scheme for the very poor. So, in total we will be covering about 67 percent of the population for this subsidized grain and this may be one of the biggest scheme launched under the food security entitlement approach in the world. Now, as on today the direct physical cost depending upon the exchange rate is being estimated between 18 to 20 billion dollars, but this is the direct cost if you add onto it the infrastructure investment that would be needed because you will have to procure and store and move through railways and others it would need a lot of extra investments and also in stabilizing production particularly through irrigation investment then the cost is going to be more than 30 billion dollars. Uh, the biggest challenge of however uh, in this Indian case is that the public distribution, the delivery system for subsidized grain as on today suffers from large leakages. There is about 40 percent leakage in the public distribution system. So, unless that is plugged, the success of this food security act will remain a question mark. Uh, other bigger challenges that to ensure that 61 million tons of food grain is distributed, you have to procure that, you have to store it and then distribute. Now this means heavy intervention of the government in the grain markets and that will drive away the private sector in many states already about 70 to 90 percent of the marketed surplus of grain is being procured by the state and unfortunately the costing of the state led bodies is much higher than what the market can deliver. So, there is a big question mark that this de facto state nationalization of grain trade in certain states, uh, will it be a cost effective measure or will it lead to higher costs? There is also an issue whether the cereal centric policies, will they lead to slowdown of diversification process towards high value crops. So, the farmers income cannot be augmented very much through cereal production, they have to move where the demand is moving and that is towards high value agriculture. 
So the big question that the nation is facing today, whether this Food Security Act will become a model for many of the other developing countries in the world to remove hunger and malnutrition uh, and give food security to the people, or will it be a muddled approach leading to high efficiency losses because it is displacing quite a bit of the markets and getting the state into the picture. Now, if the losses, efficiency losses through inefficiency in the markets uh, are higher than what the welfare gains that one is trying to achieve uh, through this price policy, uh, you know, the basic flaw in the design of this whole scheme, mega scheme, is that it is using the price policy instrument to achieve equity objectives. Whereas undergraduate economics will tell us that one should use an income policy to achieve equity objectives and price policy, let it do the job of allocating resources efficiently. But this misunderstanding about the instruments and objective functions and aligning price policy to achieve equity objectives is fraught with some danger uh, leading to massive efficiency losses. In fact, if one looks across the world and looks at the best international practices, uh, one finds the conditional cash transfers has been one of the success stories, whether India can adopt or give at least an option to the people to choose for conditional cash transfers or to go for grains physically to be distributed by the uh, state. Uh, that is an issue that needs to be discussed and debated. What it would imply for the rest of the world, I think India and perhaps also China, these are two large countries given the volatility in world prices will have to keep very high levels of stocks and these stocks, so long as these two countries are keeping high level of stocks, I am told although there are no official uh, you know, estimates about uh, China's stock, but the USDA does try to work it out what the stocks are in China, which is about 180 to 200 million tons and in India about 70 to 80 million tons. These two countries, the moment they try to have higher levels of stocks of grains, that means less is remaining in the international markets uh, and therefore puts a pressure on international prices. And as far as India is concerned, its erratic entry or exit from the global rice and wheat markets will also bring an additional uncertainty in global prices. And it would be much, much better for India to integrate its domestic economy with the global economy uh, with a possibility of, uh, you know, some sort of uh, import duties or export duties whenever the need arises, if there are jerks in the international prices, one can uh, try to somewhat uh, control that through the duties rather than through absolute bans. If we do that, I do not think that we will be hurting adversely the global markets or the global welfare and it can be a win-win situation both for the Indian masses which are looking towards food and nutritional security, but also India can be contributing to increasing global welfare. So, I would like to thank the audience for this patience and uh, my not being uh, in person there, I apologize once again and uh, pleasure to be sharing these thoughts with you.